You wouldn't believe how this country's changed. If a person has no respect for himself, how can he expect love in return? All right, I think probably a good place to start is um, what happened in Hollywood in 1971. You just give like a brief overview of that. Uh, yeah, um, I mean it was an interesting time uh, in Hollywood because what you were seeing was the sort of demise of of the classic studio um, system. Mm. So you know Hollywood that was uh, that we all kind of you know know was created in the kind of twenties and then it grew into the thirties and really the thirties and forties were this kind of amazing heyday of what's known as the studio system. And, and, you know, that's where the studios that we know, like Warner Brothers, um, um, you know, RKO or uh, uh, um, Paramount, MGM, um, th th those studios, you know, were the kind of um, dream machine industry that, that when you mm. say Hollywood in the way people sort of think about, but that model um, of filmmaking, uh, you know, was changing in the 50s and then radically changed in the 60s. And, the changes were caused by uh, a number of factors, primarily television happened, you know, so people started watching films or, or could watch this other thing that was actually in their house, whereas before they had to go to the cinema. So the, the, the economics um, changed. And then um, in, in, the, in the 60s, the world changed and American culture changed. Um, you know, the, 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 the tune-in dropout generation happened. Uh, um, um, you, you know, the social and political sort of world of, of, of America in the 60s changed. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it meant, and Hollywood was changing. So the kinds of films that, that Hollywood was making, were making at the time were, were really kind of irrelevant. I always talk about Dr. Doolittle, um, you know, which was made on a budget of, of like 19 million, which would have been 100, over 100 million today. And it only took about, you know, 8 million at the box office. So they were making these big, big films in order to compete with television. Um, and it wasn't doing anything at the box office. And then this film called Easy Rider came along in 1960, the late 1960s. And he was a, a low budget, um, non-mainstream, non-studio made film that was made for about half a million. And it ended up taking, you know, millions. Um, um, at the box office, and and it it tapped into a completely different demographic, different, and it spoke of a different a different thing, and then and the studios went, hang on a minute, look at this, this was made for how much, and it took how much, and so the the Hollywood started saying, well, these people like Dennis Hopper and and Peter Fonda and the people that were around them like Jack Nicholson, Monty Hellman, Carol Eastman, um, but we're all making the and they said, well, right, come to Hollywood, we'll make you know and there was a moment when all these outsiders were inside were now inside and they made these very um personal um counterculture anti-authoritarian films through the kind of late 60s and early 70s until the arrival of jaws and, and star wars kind of then redescribed the yeah. or, or gave birth to the blockbuster and the franchise um, but in that period was was an amazing um, original, I would say, filmmaking um, that that came out of the mainstream of Hollywood, um, of Hollywood, and and uh, in in that sort of seven or eight year period was was a kind of amazing range of films, um, and and seventy one that when you nineteen seventy one when you look at what was released, um, you know five easy pieces, um, two lane blacktop, and the you know the films that were showing and more. Kind of suggested that that uh, demonstrate really that 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 Hollywood could make a different kind of cinema. Mm. 
did you think it was sort of inevitable that um hollywood films would come to reflect the sort of uh new demographics that were interested or do you think it was quite calculated well i don't i don't think it was inevitable i have to say but i mean what was inevitable was the profit margin the 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 when they saw the profit margin of Easy Rider, that was that's what was inevitable, um, mm. the, 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 and it, where that made financial sense. So um, whether or not they they agreed with 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 you, you know the images and the story that was up on screen and these kind of hippies that were cocaine smuggling and dropping acid, um, you know, I, 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 with a soundtrack that 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 featured all these, as I say, you, you know, the kind of hate Ashbury summer of love type soundtrack. I mean, it, you know, Jack Warner would, would would completely not understand what the hell was going on. Where's Gary Cooper? You know, where's where's Catherine Hepburn? Where's, you know, where, where are all these people that, and it's like, so so it it, it wasn't, in the, the only inevitability about it was that they would respond to the profit margin. Um, mm. And the rest, the, the rest is, is then up to other sort of decisions. But, but the economic one is, is the is the imperative that Hollywood um, exists and so um, that demonstration by Easy Rider um, and and indeed um, you know Bonnie and Clyde before it and some other films but Easy Rider was the key one because it it it, it was so um, it was so successful at the cinema um, and if you're a factory producing films and you see something that's successful then you say I want a piece of that action. Yeah, that's the bit that I find interesting is the sort of how the tension between the sort of economic and creative sides of it go together. Because I was, yeah, I had in my written down questions, um, like, do you think there are any limitations to the creativity of the filmmakers making those films? Or, but from what you just said, it sounds like um, those films were able to be well the filmmakers were able to be as creative as they wanted because that would increase the sort of profit margins well it, it wouldn't necessarily increase the profit margins but but there was a chance of making a profit on them as illustrated by easy rider i mean the story of tulane blacktop and monty hellman's um experience sort of says the the problem um, um and also dennis hopper's film after easy rider um you know so so what happens is easy rider is a huge success the logic is like you know even before all of this the logic with Austin Wells um and 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 um you know given free reign to make the films that he wants because he's the boy wonder um you know he makes citizen kane it doesn't generate the kind of money that 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 they expected or and it caused a lot of trouble um so his next film magnificent ambersons they take and recut so his power Within the system begins to sort of get you know get smaller and smaller. So yeah. after Easy Rider, um, Hopper's on a, a, a you know a big high because he's got the Midas touch. He he's given he's given money to make his next project, the last movie, which bombs completely. And and Hopper's you know kind of outside outside the mainstream then you know, um, and sort of yeah. turns up turn, turns up as a as a as a drugged out photographer in Apocalypse Now, um, but. But the the story of Monty Hellman though is the, is for me the bigger illustration, which is, um, you know he was he was around Jack Nicholson. Um, uh, he was a good friend of Jack Nicholson's and and wrote scripts with Nicholson before Jack Nicholson was anywhere known. I mean this was before Easy Rider even. Um, so I mean Nicholson was part of that outsider group, you know. And it's 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 sort of difficult now to sort of remember that Nicholson, that big star. Um, it was actually, you know, part of that sort of counterculture sort of movement. But they were making films with with the, the ultimate outsider, Roger, Co the ultimate inside outsider or outside insider, which is Roger Corman, the producer. And you know, Corman was was making um, B movies, uh, um, you know, on the back of what was kind of happening in the mainstream. Um, and you know, so westerns, for example. So he got Monty Hellman and, and Jack Nicholson and Carol Eastman to to make some really low budget uh, westerns, um, which they did. Um, and then, as I say, the the this kind of moment of Easy Rider and everything happened. The studios, you know, got all that talent that they could, you know, um, sweep up, and Monty Hellman was part of it. 
So Monty Hellman get, gets to make his feature film, which is Two Lane Blacktop, which is kind of like, um, which is a kind of like um, uh, a, a, a sort of um, an existential uh, easy rider um, without without the without the soundtrack um, and and without the drugs. Uh, so it's a bit, it's a much it's a much more um, subdued affair. And it, it's highly influenced by, Hellman is highly influenced by European filmmaking like Antonioni, um, uh, especially, but you know, that kind of, and Godard and, you know, that kind of European new wave that was happening. So, yeah. that, and, and also he, Hellman was, was really, um, I mean, he was, he was one of the, the, the first people to put on a theatrical production of, of Beckett's Waiting for Godot. So you can see the kind of terrain that he's 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 sort of in. Yeah. Um, and he makes this film Two Lane Blacktop, which is about it, 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 the, the characters of the, are the, the driver, the mechanic, the girl. Um, and, you know, they drive um, through through this kind of un, virtually unseen and hot on Hollywood American landscape. Um, and I mean, I don't know if you've if you've if you've seen the film. But um, the the ending is one of the most terminal <laughs> endings, um, and you know, abstract and experimental and avant garde that you will ever ever see in in the mainstream of American cinema, um, and it's terminal. Um, and of course, this was being described as the next Easy Rider. Um, a, a magazine in America at the time put it on. I can't. I think it was Esquire put it on the front cover, saying, you know, this is the greatest American film ever made. Um, Two Lane Blacktop, they published the whole script. Um, the film gets, I mean, the other thing is that whilst M Monty Hellman was making the film, he was being, his next project was going to be Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. Um, so he was already signed up to do his next film whilst he was making Two Lane Blacktop. Two Lane Blacktop gets released into the cinema. Boom. I mean, the, 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 there's tumbleweed, uh, you know, through the, through the, the the auditoriums, there's there's critical savaging, you know, complete. What the hell is this? Um, and um, Sam Peckinpah went on to make Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, and and Monty Hellman kind of you know ended his life. Sadly, I mean he he died earlier this year, but he was doing Airbnb to to make money. Um, so so you can see the way in which. Um, you, you know the the you know Hollywood opens its doors, but it very quickly closes the doors if you're not hitting that yeah. if you're not hitting that box office. And of course, this is where Jaws and, and Star Wars came in because again, both of those directors, George Lucas and Steven Spielberg, were were kind of part of that group. I mean, I think Spielberg was less part of the counterculture um, than than you know Monty Hellman and 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 Hopper. Um, and and he'd worked in television as well. I mean, I indeed had, had quite a few of those. But but the the interesting thing is that and I mean both of them, Spielberg and Lucas at the time, weren't thinking that they had made the most financially successful films ever. They were just making you know films that they wanted to make, and they were given the space to do it. But the thing about Jaws and Star Wars in particular, seventy five and seventy seven, was how they performed at the box office, and that is it where. It kind of helped Hollywood re-model um, itself around an economic model um, that they could see how it, it worked. Um, and, and then the kind of predictability of the sequel and the franchise and all of these things was, was, was born, in effect, out of that. Well, I think, I'm actually, that's another thing I want to ask you, because I know um, with Jaws and Star Wars and Alien and that kind of film, um, or those blockbusters, they had quite specific marketing campaigns so I'm just wondering if um I don't really know so much about Easy Rider like that have any particular targeted marketing in the same way no no not massively because it, it, at the time they didn't I mean even even Star Wars um even uh, Jaws I mean it kind of took a while for them to get their heads around the marketing yeah. of it the, the marketing stuff wasn't I mean marketing became a thing on the back of that but it wasn't a thing at the time you know um, I mean, nobody nobody knew that Star Wars was was you know going to going to be the thing that it became. I mean, nobody did. I mean, you know, people like people like um, I mean, even Harrison Ford said that that who was in it. But but people who were 
um, sort of colleague friends of George Lucas, like Scorsese, Coppola, Brian De Palma. I mean, I think they all watched it in, in advance and said, you know, what is this shit? You know, what are you doing? You know, it's, it's not going to, it's not, it's, the, you know, obviously. Come I mean, on. people still watch it and stay the same, to be honest. <laughs> well, well, exactly. I mean, exactly. But what, what, what do we know about it? You know, like I mean, exactly. What do we know about it? But, you know, there was a kind of, you know, yeah. meanwhile, meanwhile, you know, you know, Scorsese is doing Taxi Driver, um, it, 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 you know, other, you know, Coppola's, you know, getting Godfather and, you know, moving into, uh, moving into apocalypse now, which of course would be would, would become his, you know, kind of in a way both downfall and, and rise. But but what you had in Star Wars and and and, and Jaws was at the time it, it, the way that Jaws rolled out in the summer kind of really set the template for the summer blockbuster, right? And yeah. um, then you begin to work out how you do do it. More efficiently later on when you've got Jaws too, but the franchise for Jaws didn't really take off. Whereas the the, the franchise really took off with Star Wars, and that's when you see the birth of of the, that franchise world that we now live in, which is the Marvel, um, DC, you know that kind of side of things, and and that's what Hollywood it, after that period that that period of transition yeah. in the sixties and the seventies, that's what Hollywood I I you know, I'm kind of saying is is um, kind of reformulated itself, got on a more sort of stable ground, whereby yeah. the, the, the predictability factor was much more. So, so you've now got Fast and Furious Nine. You've got however many versions of Star Wars there are. You've got you know, so so that's a world that's replicable, and therefore there's less financial um, there's financial risk, but there's less um, there's less sort of um, it, it create there's less creative flies in the ointment, um, shall, shall we say? And and in a way, you know, that's one of the points. I've just written a piece that we'll, we'll publish on on the website. But it, in a way, I have kind of brought the 1971 thing up to to today because I am sort of saying you've got directors like Chloe Zhao, who who you know have made amazing independent films and who are now going into Hollywood. And I sort of think, well, it, you know. Are they going to make the film that they want to make, um, or are they making the film that Hollywood wants them to make? Yeah, I was really thinking about that when I watched Nomadland, actually. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. in a way, Nomadland could have been made in 1971 in Hollywood, you know, and actually with Monty Hellman's Two Lane Blacktop, it probably was. Um, mm. But but it, it, I think, but that was, as I say, made within that the Hollywood mainstream, and I think there is an interesting. And, and Scorsese talks about it in his article that he wrote for for um, Harper's magazine, which, which is um, you know how 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 an, how an independent sort of navigates these spaces, um, and you know I mean Chloe Zhao may well absolutely want to make uh, uh, you know and she is she's making Eternals, but but I I sort of you know look at those films in 1971, and 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 look at what Hollywood was you know, this dream machine, dream factory, whatever you want to call it, was making and think, why why can't it do that now? And especially with streaming, maybe streaming platforms will do it, I don't know, but maybe with streaming platforms doing everything else, why doesn't Hollywood say, well, actually, let's have Nomadland, um, uh, let's have Nomadland too. <laughs> anyway. I mean, a lot of the Netflix originals and Amazon Prime originals, that kind of thing, some of them, the varying degrees of some of them are terrible. There's a couple that were all right, but there's always just this, like, underlying feeling of this was made to be very easily consumed. Well, I, you see, I think that's that for me is the interesting thing about these films. Um, and I really, I mean, you, you know, as I say, I've written about um, a piece that we'll publish on the, on the website because it's really when I went back to the films and watched them, you know, McCabe and Mrs. Miller, uh, Clue, um, oh, I'm really excited about that one. I seen it. Yeah, um, you, you know that what you're seeing is a real, um, both formal experimentation, um, and McCabe and Mrs. Miller's extraordinary when looking back on it. There's a real formal experimentation, and there's a real sense of trying to tell or telling and trying to tell different kinds of of, of American stories. You know. That it's not all within a kind of um, um, you know easy sort of genre 
I'm not saying that genre is easy, but what I mean is that you know you're working within genres that that the 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 audiences have got their expectations there. The film delivers against those expectations. Now, McCabe and Mrs. Miller is a western, but it's not like a western that that you, you we, we we kind of know when we say the word western. It's a very alternative uh, western, yeah. amazing with amazing performance from Julie Christie. Um, as as the, the the woman that shows Warren Beatty how to do business properly, you know. So so there's really you know it's, it's very much and it's very much play, not playing but challenging mainstream representations as well, you know, which which yeah. I think which I think is also interesting. So I would urge people to watch the films in the first place, uh, rewatch or watch, uh, and just. As I say, be be I think be amazed by the the sort of I've described it as a kind of the defiant independent spirit um, that these films represent. And you know what is even more extraordinary about them was that Hollywood said you know allowed it to happen. You know within the mainstream of film culture, and then the door was closed. Yeah, that's really interesting because I think it's very easy to see Hollywood as a kind of just faceless corporate money making machine, which I think, to be fair, even with this, it still is a bit. But you know, it allows different well, types. I think, we, I think the motive, the the, the 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 motive is, of course, primarily financial. You know, I mean, and probably even yeah. more so now because the companies, you know, the studios are part of global conglomerates um, who who are not even necessarily American. I mean, we sort of we sort of delude ourselves if we say Hollywood these days and think of you know this lovely kind of creative community in LA that are going oh let's make all these wonderful films within the studios and this is great. I mean, they're actually part of you know um, um, global corp corporations that are one. Yeah, I find one it very difficult. I find it very difficult to like visualize what it would look like in my head, Hollywood, because yeah, like as you say, it's kind of like. To watching Sue Spiracy, one of the interesting things I said in that is about how everyone's idea of the fishing industry is um, just these little fishing boats with yeah. little nets, and it's like no, looking at the they're just yeah, yeah. massive killing. I think Hollywood's yeah. probably similar. But I think I mean I think that's an interesting you know that is an interesting um, observation you know because it, it's the way in which you, you sort of see fishing and you think oh somebody with a fly rod and they're just casting their you know or they're going out in a little boat or you know they're in a little puffer or whatever. and actually. It's a in it's an industrial scale exploitation of our, res our resources, um, yeah, and, it's an and ecosystem. yeah, and 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 kind of when you say Hollywood, you think you think Cecil B. DeMille, uh, you know Alfred Hitchcock in Hollywood, you know you sort of have an idea of Hollywood, and and it's no longer that thing. Absolutely, it's a completely different thing. And 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 what what happened going back to the the, the Easy Rider scenario in, in the sixties is that you know what was happening was that you were seeing kind of um, profound um, changes in society, and the need for the studios to um, change in relationship to that. And it, it didn't know how to do it until, um, you know, it, it, didn't, it, it took a good 15, 20, 30 even years um, for it to be able to kind of, in a way, come back into a, 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 a business model that, that made sense to them. I wanted to ask you about Polly Platt quickly. Yes. Um, oh, yeah, that's but, a good point. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah well, just because it's a very male dominated industry and then there's Polly Platt coming along and doing quite a lot and not getting a lot of recognition for it. Yeah I mean I, I, that's one of the uh, things the that, basic understanding I have of it. But. Yeah I mean that's one of the things I, I, I wanted to do again by picking um, by doing the season and by doing the films. I've meant you know I mentioned Carol Eastman she she wrote the script for um, Five Easy Pieces which 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 I think is extraordinary given that the film is about uh, a, a dissatisfied uh, male, uh, middle class male, um, and and it, it's got one of the kind of career defining scenes for Jack Nicholson when he's in the diner trying to order his his sandwich, and it you know it's a real career defining performance that she wrote it, and she wrote the and she was friends with 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 Jack Nicholson as I say Jack Nicholson and Monty Hellman, and and so women were were always part of the creative scene, and as I say. 
going back to the Monty Hellman story, um, you know, it was Monty Hellman, Jack Nicholson, and Carl Eastman. Um, and then the, the similarly with Polly Platt, um, she she's severely been overshadowed by her partner at the time who made um, Last Picture Show, Peter Bogdanovich. And, and there are all sorts of, um, well, there's kind of arguments about who was the creative force in there. And if you read, um, you know, Peter Biskin's Easy Riders, Raging Bulls, you'll see that um, a lot of people say, that. yeah, a lot of people say that it was Polly, it was Polly Platt who was actually the creative force behind it, um, and, and and then you know they um, you know split up, and she, you know, she but she went on to to be a phenomenal force within Hollywood. Polly Platt as a um, you, you know as, as sort of designer um, producer, um, you know. I mean, she, she really connected a lot of different people in Hollywood um, and, as I say, worked there considerably. And, um, you know, I think uncovering and revealing her um, contribution, and I know that the podcast, you, the, the, the website, the podcast, you must remember this, has done a brilliant um, series on Polly Platt that really... Yeah, I started that one. Yeah. It's quite long. Yeah, no, it is. But you see, the thing is, that's 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 the thing is, there's a lot, there's lots to tell, and this is a yeah. kind of way of because otherwise it gets lost. And the other thing about um, um, the last picture show is is the performance from Clarice Leachman, who she won the best supporting actress, and she died sadly earlier this year. Um, and it's an extraordinary performance so, um, that she gives in in um, the last picture show, and so. I certainly do want to draw to attention um, because, yeah, that, that period, that, you know, what's known as the New Hollywood or um, American New Wave is dominated by your Coppola's, Scorsese's, Lucas's and those people that went on to you yeah. know, the kind of great white male auteurs that actually, they're, they're, you know, you know, if you look at, if you look at um, George Lucas, it was, it was his, his wife, then wife Marcia Lucas, who was editing his films. Um, and um, it, it, and then you know Scorsese, um, it, it, you know, ha, has had a creative partnership with Thelma Schoonmaker since the seventies, and um, that continues to this day. You know, um, and and that's rarely sort of um, these these um, women within that um, period are, are kind of yeah, unfortunately, um, not brought more to the attention that they deserve. So. It, you know that was part of the sort of thinking about about doing this season and um invisible women have have done a, a piece of um research and writing for us that they are that we've published on the website which goes into that in a bit more in a bit more detail well thanks for talking to me mark it's been a really interesting chat but th thank you very much and i look forward to seeing you in the cinema watching some of these films cheers yes, i'm gonna be at a lot of them Great. Okay.